started. Let me get the screen share up and going. So for those of you who are participating in this on um, Zoom, you should see now the opening slide of the, of the slide presentation. And we are uh, in a moment gonna get started. Hi, Susan. Hi, Debbie. Phyllis, how are you? Madeline, how are you? Brian and Jack and Bobby in different rooms so they can actually have a conversation against each other, I'm guessing at the same time as everybody else. Um, but we have so much time and so little to do. No, wait a minute. And the great words of the Willy Wonka, strike that, reverse it, right? So much, so much to cover in so little time. Um, we have a couple of new students in the room today. So just a, a, a brief overview as to where we have been so we know where we're going. Um, we're talking about in these four weeks, four different periods in American Jewish history. And remember, this is not meant to be a four-part lecture to capture the entire history of the American Jewish experience, right? The title of this course was intentionally Moments in American Jewish History. I've picked out a couple of moments and brought forth some primary sources so we can get a snapshot of what was happening at a, at a particular time, right? So we're not getting the entire picture, but going deep on a couple of moments. So we talked about initially in the first session, some things from the colonial and revolutionary period. In particular, the back and forth between Peter Stuyvesant and the Dutch, Dutch West Indies Company about whether or not Jews should be allowed onto the island of New Amsterdam. Stuyvesant wanted to keep them out. And the Dutch India Company said, no, I'm sorry, you can't do that, in part because they're nice people and in part because they're giving us a lot of money. The Jews from Amsterdam were funding the Dutch West India Company and we weren't going to allow them to do that. And then we went forward 100 years to the story of George Washington and what is now known as Toro Synagogue in Newport and the foundations of the country. You'll read more about that in the Shabbat message tomorrow morning if you missed that lecture. Last week, we looked at a couple of elements from the Civil War. Particularly, we looked at a, a blessing that was written by the rabbi in Richmond, Virginia for Confederate soldiers to say on their behalf as they were going into battle. And we looked at the episode of General Grant's General Orders Number 11, which excluded Jews from the Department of the Tennessee, which included Northern Mississippi and Western Tennessee and Kentucky, uh, that the Jews of certain areas, and in particular Paducah, Kentucky, went all the way to the executive mansion in Washington and had an audience with President Lincoln himself to get reversed. Um, and it came back to bite General Grant when he was running for president in 1868, but not too much because he was successful. We may return to that today as well. Today, we're going to look at some things around the turn of the century. And next week, we'll conclude with some contemporary issues. Zionism in the 20th century. Uh, we're going to look at the statement from the reform movement about patrilineal descent, which I'm going to argue is maybe the most influential documents in of modern Jewish uh, history because of what it has done to the Jewish community and how we have processed that. But today we're looking at the turn of the century, right? The move from the, the 19th century into the 20th century. We're not going to get into World War II and the Holocaust. We're not going to get into really the, the real push of the Zionist movement. It's really going to be the sort of 1880s to the 1920s. And we're gonna look at two different issues. And if you look at, if you read Jonathan Sarno's book, American Judaism that I'm holding up, he suggests that basically around the turn of the 20th century, there are really two issues that the Jewish community in America uh, are confronting. One is the question of immigration, immigration to the US. And the other issue that they were facing, which was the rise of the movements, right? Meaning reform, orthodox, conservative, the rise of the movements as powers and organizations within the American Jewish community and the beginning of, um, of the establishment of an ideologically fractured Jewish community, right? Which was different than what you saw in Europe, right? What you saw in Europe is you saw to a, I wouldn't even call it fracture. We saw different ethnic, right? There were Ashkenazi Jews and there were Mizrahi Jews and there were Sephardi Jews. There were Jews who organized themselves about how they practiced a little bit differently based on those various rites, R-I-T-E-S, but they were all observant in a traditional way, right? We saw obviously in the, in the 19th century, the beginnings of 
Reform Judaism in Germany, but the establishment of, of a reform movement and the establishment of orthodoxy as these sort of separate camps within Judaism that were practicing in America and practicing in dialogue or opposition, depending on how you look at it with each other, really comes out of this period. We'll see some examples of that. Questions before we get started? I want to make sure that I have my chat up and ready. Um, okay. Good. Here we go. Immigration. In 1883, a man named Judah Lieb Levin, who was a poet and a socialist, was a writer, and he wrote this description of what was going on in Russia, right? And really, what we'll see over and over again is Russia really refers to the entirety of the pale, right? It was Russia, it was Romania, it was Poland, it was that existence in the pale that settled. And we know that the history of the late 19th century, that for a lot of Jews, and these are maybe the stories of your own family, which is, I didn't move my house, but my nationality changed four times, right? Because as battles were fought and political lines moved east and west across Eastern Europe, a house that was in Poland, then became part of this country, then became part of that kingdom, then became part of that. But one of the questions that gets raised by the late 19th century, as the situation for Jews in Eastern Europe gets more and more and more dire, is, should we leave? And if we leave, should where should we go? And what were the two options? Raise your hand if you think you know one of them. Liliana? Liliana, you're still on mute. The United States. One option was to go to the US. Good. And the other option? Bobby? Israel. Israel. Israel right? Now, obviously, 1883, Israel, it, the, the idea of Israel was really, really just like it wasn't even a Zionist. This is before the World Zionist Congress. This is before Im Tirtzu Ein Zawagada, right, where Herzl said we should all move to Israel. It was the kernel of an idea, but it was our ancient homeland. There was a Jewish community there. Um, some things to keep in mind is that the waves of immigration that came from Eastern Europe of Jews into America really took off around this point, and the numbers got a lot bigger. But here's the question that Judah Lieb Levin raised. It is clear that if there were no other proposal for saving tens of thousands of our brothers from their hard and bitter sufferings, if there were no other way in which our people could be reborn and fulfill their destiny, then it would be easier to reconcile ourselves to a thousand sacrifices and to the European spiritual abominations in order to live in tranquility without fear for the wraths of tyrants who threaten to disperse and destroy us without fear that at any moment our lives and property may be pillaged and plundered. Whew does not describe a particularly happy existence living in Eastern Europe at this time. But before us lies the prospect of deliverance from evil and national rebirth in the land of America. The intelligent man, man will therefore choose this path, arguing that although the ancient memories of our souls were not bound up with the American soil, it is nonetheless a suitable land to which in which to raise up the remnants of Israel. For it is a country settled by enlightened peoples of culture and civilized behavior. Furthermore, there the Jews unconstrained by the commandments enjoined upon them concerning their own soil will be able to lead a good life. And America has a further advantage in connection with the rebirth of our nation. And that is this, in the Holy Land, our dream will be far from realized. There we would be slaves to the sultan and the pashas. There is here we would, be, we would bear a heavy burden in the midst of a wild desert people, sustaining ourselves with the distant hope that if our numbers increase sufficiently, we might perhaps, after many years, become another small principality that will finally, in some ultimate utopia, achieve its destiny. But in America, our dream is closer to fulfillment. For the constitution of that country provides that when the number of colonists reaches 60,000, 
they have the right to establish a separate state with a governor, ministers, and a constitution, and determine their own laws and our hope of attaining our independence and leading our lives in accordance with our beliefs and inclinations would not be long deferred. Kindly note, my friend, that I speak not only of the advantages in regard to spiritual rebirth, I have not mentioned the material advantages of America, as they are obvious and require no proof. Our brethren beg for relief from oppression. They must find a safe haven. Our rich and generous must rescue the lost flock of Israel from the dwellings of lions. Let the rich find any place which suits them if only they save our wretched brethren. The eloquence of the Bible, the pietist spectacle of the bereaved daughters of Zion, the emotion aroused by our ancient memories, all these speak for the land of Israel. The good life recommends America. You know, my friend, that, that many will yearn for the Holy Land, and I know that even more will stream to America. Let there be no quarrel. Let the writers sharpen their pens, but in the meantime, the generous must rise up to rescue their oppressed and persecuted brethren in any way they may choose. Huh. What are we hearing that? What surprised you? If you want to speak, go ahead and raise your hand or unmute yourself and go ahead. Debbie, if you're talking, you're on mute. I've been reading. You've been reading. It's just reading. <laughs> Shirley, go ahead. Hang on, Shirley. I accidentally muted you. You, you got to unmute yourself. That was my fault. All right. Go ahead. I'm actually surprised by how pessimistic his outlook is on how long it would take, um, you know, for Israel, not Israel, but, but to have a decent life in what was to become Israel. Um, it sounds like um, he's not very persuasive about that being the right, the right choice to make. Well, remember when this was, this was 1883, right? Yeah, so I'm very impressed with the people who made that choice. I mean, that was very courageous. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I appreciate that he says, look, we know that our homeland is our homeland. And we know that for, eight, for 1810 years, we have been wanting the return to Zion. But from a very pragmatic perspective, if we're looking for a place where the Jews of the pale, who are feeling less and less and less safe in their homes, are looking for safety, the answer for him, obviously, for the safe and the good life, is not moving to the land of Israel and trying to build a Jewish community. The answer is to move to America, where one already exists, with the blessings of the, you know, of the president and of the Constitution. Brian, I think, did you, were you raising your hand? Yeah, the thing I really, as pessimistic as he is about establishing a, a place where we would be subject to the whims of the sultans and so forth, the Holy Land, and how difficult that would be, how optimistic he is about how it would be in America when we reach 60,000 when there we be, can form our own principality, because that is what the law is, when we could be a separate state. Yeah. That comes out from an unrealistic, really, approach, but an oversell. Well, what was he trying to accomplish? Because that, that struck me to the idea of building a Jewish state in America. Which really was pie in the sky. I mean, it was really a... a, a Huge, huge uh, industry. thing to hold out that there would be a possibility for establishing a Jewish state in the Americas. So interestingly, around the same time, there was another religious group who had basically done that, had moved to establish their own state within the Union, and that was the state of Utah that was founded by the Latter-day Saints Church. Right? They moved there and they built a community and turned it into a state. And by the way, the fight between the United States of America and the state of Utah for its duly ordained and established representatives to be seated in the House 
and to be seated in the Senate went on for multiple decades. Right? There's a whole story that we can get into about how the state of Utah was discriminated against by the U.S. government because of its Mormon background, particularly around polythe about uh, polytheism, around um, <laughs> polygamy. Um, but it was there. But this idea that, oh, wait, the U.S. Constitution says if any 60,000 people come together, they can form a state. He absolutely was saying if enough, if enough Jews move to America, we could create a state within the union that was a Jewish state, right? And we and he clearly had read the letter from Washington. It said Jews are free to welcome or are welcome here and free to practice here as they should feel so comfortable. It's really inspiring. And in many ways, you know, for you know, let let's let's just smush 60 years together into one moment, right? Let's look at the last scene in um in Fiddler on the Roof, right? I'm going to America. I'm going to Israel, right? Like, and it was like, oh, that sounds like a really good idea. Good luck to you, right? When uh, Steven Spielberg wrote An American Tale, the answer was that, that there are no cats in Israel. There are plenty of cats in Israel, by the way, um, although there weren't back then. Uh, there's a whole story behind the cats in Israel, but it was America, right? And as we'll see in a moment, the the story of America and coming into Ellis Island and the Statue of Liberty is such an important part. And that was really, and, and this, this note from Julie Levin suggests that in 1883, that was where to go. And this really was sort of, and if you look at the numbers, around this time, immigration to the US by Jews went like this. It really took off and established the American Jewish community that you and I know. And the American Jewish community that you and I are the, bene the, the, the beneficiaries of all of these generations later, right? It was your, maybe your grandparents, maybe your parents, my great grandparents who were the ones who my great grandparents moved here from that area in the 1900s, right? 1900, 1910 teens. My grandparents were born in the 1920s and early 30s in this country. All four were born in the US, born to immigrants who had moved here. And it's a result of this thinking of Judah Lee Levin that said in, which is America's the place to go, at least for now. Obviously, things change a lot after the Zionist Congress. Things change a lot when the establishment of Israel becomes less of a dream and more of a reality, as, as Herzl would have wanted. But at this point in history, you would have had to have been nuts to think Israel was the place to go, unless you really wanted to be a builder. If you wanted to move for a better life as a Jew, it's clear. The place to go, America. Steve, you want to say something? No? Okay. Jules. Hang on, Julie. Let's get you, let's get you unmuted. Okay. Go ahead, Julie. One nice, one good thing about the immigration to the U.S. from those who chose to come to the U.S. is that when they came to New York, they didn't have to learn a different language. They continued to speak Yiddish, which was the language they spoke. We're going to get to that in a second. We're going to get to that in, 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 a, in not, not the next document, but the one after that. All right. So let's move on to the next. This document, I think, is going to be familiar to many, 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 many of you. Um, but I want to give a little bit of context because the next document is the very well known. Poem by Emma Lazarus, The New Colossus. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land, here at our sea-washed sunset gate shall stand a mighty woman with a torch, whose flame is the imprisoned lightning and her name mother of exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome, her mild eyes command, the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep ancient lands your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these the homeless tempest toss to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Who's heard those words before? A few people, right? I love the idea, by the way, an air bridge harbor that twin cities. What two cities? 
Madeline, you're on. You're still on mute, Madeline. You're on mute still. Chicago and New York. No. No. I think it's actually Manhattan and Brooklyn. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Two. It, it was different birth, different cities that were one. You know, the the, the borough piece of it. Um, it's that. It's the idea that New, that New York was different cities. Remember, the bridges hadn't been built yet. The, not all of them, right? Certainly not the Tappan Zee Bridge, right? So the connection between the various between the various boroughs, the various islands of New York, were not interconnected. With you know, the bridge and tunnel crowd wasn't the same in 1883 as it is in 2020. So the idea of them it being this unified thing with it, it, it was it was different. The story of this poem is really interesting, right? So France gifts the U.S. the Statue of Liberty, but not the podium, not the pedestal upon which she was erected. And so the U.S. had a had a raised the funds for this, and they had a and they wanted to have an inscription. They wanted to have a poem inscribed to the bottom. The message of the statue that France had intended was not about immigration. It was about liberty. It was about little r republicanism. It was about this idea of self-governance by the people. The idea of the Statue of Liberty having such an important immigration message only exists because of the decisions that Emma Lazarus made, who was, the, who was a Jewish woman from New York. She came from the upper crust of Jewish society in New York. She had had a history of writing about the Jewish causes and anti-Semitism and those kinds of things. And so you see, I think in this poem, some of the same language that we saw in the piece by Judah Lieb Levin, that the experience of the Jews of the pale was wretched. It was a really difficult experience. And she was already seeing these, these ways of integration coming from the pale. And so she wrote this poem to say, let this statue be your welcome spot, right? As these immigrants were coming by boat into New York Harbor to Ellis Island, they would sail past what? They would sail past the Statue of Liberty. And by writing this poem and winning the competition and it being inscribed upon the base of the statue, it gave the Statue of Liberty this other message as well. Liberty, not only meaning liberty in terms of the way that we govern ourselves here in an open and free democratic republic, but freedom from the enslavement, the wretchedness, the, the tyranny of Eastern Europe and other places, that America is a place that you, free, that you flee oppression to come to live in freedom. And I think that they're tied together, but in some ways it was Emma Lazarus who tied them together by having the welcome, right? And you know, that story, and you see it in an American tale. If you're on that ship sailing across the Atlantic, how do you know when you've arrived? When you see her torch, her beacon hand up in the air, her beacon hand glows glows worldwide welcome. The flame. Jack. Jack, you got to unmute. Jack, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. I would, I, I hadn't thought about it much, but I assume that most of the ship's origins from Europe was from England. The ships were, but the passengers were not. No, no, but the thing is many of us, how many didn't get onto the ships that basically stayed in England, in France? Some? Yeah. So that's a different course for a different day. I'll take it. Yeah. yeah. Brian, Brian and then Roberta. No, no oh. Jack, uh, the ships were not solely from England. A lot of people came from Germany. A lot of ships left from Hamburg and a great deal of the uh, people came. Uh, when you bring up two cities, it is rather clear that the history of the city of Brooklyn and the history of the city of New York 
are really very, very different. Mm -hmm. New York was definitely molded much more by the British. In, in Brooklyn, the Dutch influence still remains. And there was a difference in attitude between Hempstead and North Hempstead. Sure. Uh, and, and the Jews really did go to North Hempstead. That's the settlement of the Williamsburg uh, area. The settlement in New York is strictly in the Lower East Side. Yep. But all of that affects how the Jews were when they came to the United States and what they expected. It, it, it's, it's also yeah. a very interesting story. I, I just pointed out because it didn't, it, it would strike someone as odd to, to consider New York Harbor spanning multiple cities. But you're right, at the time there were different, there were different cities with different cultures and, and absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks, Brian. Roberta. To add on to that, um, and you are right, it had to be Brooklyn. Um, people from the Bronx say that they're going downtown. People from Brooklyn and Queens say that they're going into the city when they go to Manhattan. And it's because of when the five boroughs each joined the city of New York. Uh, that you have that uh, linguistic difference. Uh, I wanted to say besides Hamburg, the Jews from Southern Europe came from a city that was the near the border between Italy and Croatia. And there's actually a little museum in that town that I've gone through about the ships that emigrated to the US. Jack's point is well taken, which is that the ships did not originate from the Pale of the Settlements, and there were multiple ports, as Brian and Roberta pointed out, across West Europe that were port cities where, you know, the struggle to get from Romania wasn't just buying a ticket. It was getting from Romania to a port city and then securing passage on a ship. And, it, you know, fortunately, at this time in the 1880s and 90s, there were not there were not meaningful restrictions on immigration that didn't come until 1920, which we're going to get to in a second. Um, so it was easy to get into the United States once you arrived. It was just getting on that ship that was often the, the very, very difficult part of the journey. All right, let's move forward a little bit now. And we're going to move into um, the end of the 20th, the 19th century. And this was a piece in a magazine still in publication, the Atlantic Monthly, July 1898 by Abraham Kahan. Um, and it was about what was the experience where right? we talked, we hear Jonah, Lu, uh, Jonah, Judah Lieb Levin talking about the experience for Russian Jews in Russia. We have Emma Lazarus welcoming them. And now here's Abraham Kahan talking about what the welcome was like for Russian Jews. And by Russian, he really means everybody, right? Russian speaking area, the whole pale, not just Russia proper. Um, and Julie, what you mentioned about how there was a comfortable place here for Yiddish speakers, um, absolutely. The Jewish population in the United States has grown from a quarter million to about one million. That's a lot of 60,000 person states. Scarcely a large American town, but some has Russia, uh, but some have Russia Jewish names in its directory with an educated Russian speaking minority forming a colony with Yiddish speaking, within a Yiddish speaking colony. While cities like New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, and Boston each have a ghetto rivaling in extent the population of the largest Jewish cities in Russia, Austria, and Romania. The number of Jewish residents in Manhattan borough is estimated at 250,000, making it the largest Jewish center of Hebrew, a large center of Hebrew population in the world. The Russian tongue, which 20 years ago was as little used in this country as Persian, has been added to the list of languages spoken by an appreciable portion of the polyglot immigrant population. Have the newcomers justified the welcome extended to them from Chickering Hall? Have they proved the desirable accession to the American nation? He's open, we're gonna continue. So what he says is, look how great this place is. The Jews are everywhere. Every big city's got a Jewish population. I wanna note the usage of the word ghetto from 1898 clearly predating the, the, the exercise of, of Nazi Germany, right? We know that ghetto goes back multiple centuries to Italy, right? And described that the Jewish populations of certain areas and the idea of using the ghetto, the word ghetto to describe a Jewish enclave in a larger city seems very blase, I think, in this, in this usage. Just as an interesting point out. 
Does anyone know from Chickering Hall? I had a dig. So there was a Chickering Hall in Boston and there was a Chickering Hall in New York. It's the one in New York they were talking about. In 1882, there was a gathering in Chickering Hall in New York in support of the plight of Russian, Russian Jewish immigrants. I'm gonna share now a very interesting political cartoon from Chickering Hall in 1882. Take a look at this. Who do we, who is this picture of? Unmute yourself and answer the question. Ulysses S. Grant. It's right. It's it's now former President Grant, right? Yeah. And he's advertising for a meeting in Chickering Hall for the sympathy of the persecuted Jews in Russia. What is he doing? He's trying to undo the harm he did when he uh, evacuated or you know, sent out all the Jews from the town, was it Kentucky? It was someplace See, yeah. around there. What, what kind of suit is he wearing? Crocodile tears, crocodile. I mean, crocodile tears for excluding the Jews from the army in 1862 and excluding the Jews uh, by order number 11, right? He's trying to change his tone of this. So this cartoon comes from this magazine, which was known as Puck. Oh yeah. Very first successful humor magazine in the United States that was founded in 1871. So it was a fairly new publication at this time, only about 10 years old. And the cartoonist, a guy named Bernhard Gilliam, drew this cartoon to needle Ulysses Grant, right? Because at this meeting at Chickering Call, he shows up in support of the Jewish community, right? Offering his support for the plight of Russian Jews who had been persecuted. And they're saying, oh, now you weep. And I perceive you feel the dint of pity, the caption says. These are gracious drops. Look at these crocodile tears from Ulysses S. Grant about the plight of the Jews, meaning he don't care. He doesn't really care about the Jews. He cares about their vote. He cares about them supporting what he cares for. And so he shows up. Last spring, last April, April of, of 2019, I got needled by some members of the synagogue for a meeting that I went, a meeting that I was at last April at the RAC's consultation on conscience in Washington, which is the Reform Act, the, excuse me, the Religious Action Center's biannual convention in Washington, D.C. One of the speakers was um, Al Sharpton. And there were a lot of Jews, and by the way, Al Sharpton is also. Uh, being held up right now by, by the ADL in some partnership. And there are a lot of Jews who feel like what Al Sharpton is doing right now with the Jewish community. And the fact that Al Sharpton is welcoming the, the Jewish community, is engaging with Al Sharpton, is ignoring his behavior of 20 years ago and what he did particularly in Brooklyn. I think there's a, a, a bit of that here as well, which is, you know, Al Sharpton you're crying crocodile tears about the Jewish community right now and looking for that partnership. I'm not saying that I agree with that. I think there's an element to that as well. And I'll be honest, I think Al Sharpton needs to do a better job of doing some cheshbon hanefesh and doing uh, and asking for some, um, he needs to do some, some teshuva around the Jewish community, which he didn't really do. You know, he basically said to, to me last year when I was in the crowd, he said, listen, we all made some mistakes in the past and we feel bad about those and not really owning up for what he did. Grant's the same way in this, but he was there at that meeting in Pickering Hall that Abraham, that Abraham Kahan was referring to. Ulysses S. Grant was there offering his support for the Jewish community, which I find to be just really, really interesting. Now, Kahan con continues. 
Let another man praise thee, he wrote. This is the same the same article from the Atlantic. I just threw the I threw the uh, cartoon in the middle just to contextualize Kickering Hall. Let an oh, hang on too far. Go back. Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth, a stranger, and not thine own lips. Is a proverb current among the people from whom the subject of this paper, and being one of them, I feel that it would be better, before citing figures and facts, to let Gentile Americans who have made a study of the New York ghetto answer the question. Here is what Mr. Jacob A. Reese, an accepted authority on, quote, how the other half lives, has to say of Jewish immigrants. Anyone know Jacob Reese? Yeah. Who said yes? Steve, who is Jacob Reese? He was a, a, a New Yorker. Um, I know there's a park named after him. Yeah, he was an upper class social reformer. He was a muckraking journalist. He was a big photographer. He was a, a very well known photographer. You know, one of the fathers of, of modern photography. He was a documentary photographer. And so he knew how the quote unquote other half lived, right? He knew the upper crusts of New York society, but he had these very nice things to say about the Jews of New York. They, the Jews, do not rot in their slum, but rising, pull it up after them. As to their poverty, they brought temperate habits and a redeeming love of home. Their strange customs proved the strongest ally of the Gentile health officer in his warfare upon the slum. The death rate of a, pro of a poverty stricken Jewtown, despite its crowding, is lower always than that of the homes of the rich. I am a Christian and hold that in his belief the Jew is sadly in error. So that he may respect mine, I insist on fair play for him all around. I am sure that our city has today no better and no more loyal citizen that, than that the Jew, be he rich or poor and none she has less to be ashamed of. In other words, the Jews, they might be immigrants, but they're good immigrants. There are kind of immigrants. They're immigrants who are known to pull themselves up by their bootstraps to and very quickly go from being poverty stricken, right, to being the ones who are able to take care of their own, right? You could almost hear him saying, even Peter Stuyvesant might, might approve of them because they didn't become a charge upon the society. They take care of themselves. They're healthy, they're clean. All of the aspersions you might throw at an immigrant, not the Jews. Brian. Yeah, but can we compare uh, Jacob Rees to Robin Moses? It just comes up as a whole, uh, thought immediately. There is a, a comparison. Of course there is, right? And by the way, Reese wrote that, and then Abraham Kahana, leader of the Jewish community, cited him in an article in the Atlantic, like, listen, this is what we want them to think about us, right? We want to be welcomed in this way for all of our quirks, quirks notwithstanding, right? Yeah, listen, we're all going to hell because we're Jews, but while on earth, we're good to have around. An interesting way to think about Jewish immigration around the turn of the century. Questions, comments, observations between we before we turn inside to look at intra-Jewish strife at the same time. Shirley, go ahead. Just unmute first. Okay. Um, not that I want to um, change the nature of the conversation, but. Um, no, it's not that one. Um, but I'm from Canada, and my my parents came. Oh, I'm sorry. It's just pick it up and put it down. My parents came by way of Halifax. My father uh, departed from Gestadt. Um, I'm sorry. Julie is having trouble with the phone. Just all right i'm sorry anyway um it's just interesting and i don't know if you've ever looked at at canada in terms of the people i mean my parents grew up in poland and um they came to toronto rather than new york because my mother had two older brothers who had preceded them 
Well, not to be jingoistic, but this course has moments in American Jewish history. Okay, well, but you know, it's North okay. America. Anyway. Our documents is going to mention Canada. And uh, since yesterday was Canada Day, happy Canada Day. Thank well, you very much. Okay. Bye -bye. All right. Thank you. Let's move forward now because we know that at the same time that we were moving to this country, that immigration often leads people to think a little bit differently about the customs that they bring with them, right? And the attempts to become a Russian American Jew or a Polish American Jew or whatever, if, or a Canadian Jew, right? Like, right? That there's, there's an opportunity and there's a tension there. And we know that the, that the rise of the movements is, a is in some ways a uniquely American experience. Now we saw a little bit of it in Germany and we know that the movements got exported out of America back, right? There is a reform movement in Europe and there is a reform movement in Israel, but those are really exports, imports, exported from the US and imported to those countries. It was here in, in a place where political freedom, and religious freedom together allowed for really everyone to find their own path in their, in their religiosity, right? Let's not forget that this country was founded by people who were looking for religious freedom, who, who were not allowed to worship in the way that they wanted to in their place, right? Now, we know that the, that the pilgrims were really Puritans and they were moving to the, to the, to the right religiously. And they, you know, they, they found a country, they went to a place that was not, the, the, that Britain, England was not stuck up enough for them to be comfortable. They needed a place where they can have their own stuck upness in America. But you can argue, for example, that Reform Judaism is uniquely American. And I mean that in two ways. I mean that Reform Judaism is an expression of Judaism that takes the best of what America has to offer, which is the idea of personal liberty and really, you know, no one's going to, don't tread on me Judaism in some ways, but also to suggest that, and my, and my teacher, um, uh, I'm drawing a blank on her name now. It'll come back to me. One of the professors at HUC in LA, who, uh, she's a, she's a scholar. She's not a rabbi. She's a scholar. She suggested that reform Judaism is Amer that American Judaism is reform. That it's that the reform is the only way you can be American in some ways. That it's an expression of, of what America is through the lens of Judaism. And we know that you know conservative Judaism kind of comes out in a response. I'm not going to bring the examples of the Trefa banquet in this conversation, but we know that when when H when HUC had its first graduation and and the Trefa banquet was served. There were a bunch of rabbis who had come over from Europe who said, you know what, this reform thing, it's too much. I, it's too liberal for me. I need to find a happy place between orthodoxy and this liberal mishigas of eating, of eating shellfish. So we're going to look at today two of the foundational documents of two of the movements. We're going to look at the Pittsburgh platform, which was in many ways the foundational document of the reform movement in America. And we're going to look at the... Uh, let me get the acronym right. The Organization of Orthodox Judaism, something in America. Anyway, the foundational document of the OU, which we know today as well. So here we go. 1885, the Pittsburgh Conference of American Reform Rabbis. Convening at the call of Kaufman Kohler of New York, reform rabbis from around. Wait, hang on. I got to share it. My bad. Not paying attention. Hold on one second. Didn't push the button. Begin again. Convening at the call of Kaufman Kohler of New York, reform rabbis from around the US met in November, from November 16 to November 19, 1885, with Isaac Mayer Wise presiding. The meeting was declared the continuation of the Philadelphia Conference of 1869, which was continuation of the German Conference of 1841 to 1846. The rabbis adopted the following seminal text. It's got eight parts. One, we recognize in every religion an attempt to grasp the infinite and in every mode, source, or book of revelation held in sacred and a religious system, the consciousness of the indwelling of God in man. We hold that Judaism represents the highest conception of the God idea as taught in our holy scriptures and developed and spiritualized by the Jewish teachers 
in accordance with the moral and philosophical progress of their respective ages. We maintain that Judaism preserved and defended midst cultural struggles and trials under enforced isolation. And the God idea, meaning whatever you think God is, is the central religious truth for the human race. Two, we recognize in the Bible the record of the consecration of the Jewish people to its mission as the priest and the one God and value it as the most potent instrument of religious and moral instruction. We hold that the modern discoveries of scientific researches in the domain of nature and history are not antagonistic to the doctrines of Judaism. The Bible reflecting the primitive ideas of its own age and at times clothing its conception of divine providence and justice dealing with men in miraculous narratives. Let's stop there for right one second. How does the Pittsburgh platform describe the Bible? Primitive. <laughs> Primitive. Yeah. Obviously not written by God. Not written by God. Like a Disney fairy tale, right? These are stories that send a message, but don't believe the details. Don't believe the facts. It's old. It's antiquated. We are the beneficiaries of moral reasoning, of scientific discovery. And which one takes precedence? The moral reasoning and scientific discovery. Three, we recognize in the Mosaic legislation, a system of training the Jewish people for its mission during its national life in Palestine. And today we accept as binding only its moral laws and maintain only such ceremonies as elevate and sanctify our lives, but reject all such as are not adapted to the views and habits of modern civilization. What are they talking about? Bar Mitzvah. Bar Mitzvah as an example, but really the idea of mitzvah in general and of ritual, right? Anything that Judaism suggests that enhances your moral perspective on the world, great. Anything done for a ritualistic purpose, unnecessary. The davening, the eating, the wearing, the bowing, all that stuff, unnecessary. Unnecessary. Brian. Elimination of uh, what we call halakha. Exactly right. Yeah. And halakha, both in terms, and, and halakha, and we'll see more of this in a moment, um, halakha, both in terms of the end result, right? These are the things you're supposed to do, but also halakha as the intellectual enterprise of there being a legal system to even process a question through, let alone the, the, the burdens of proof in that. We hold that all such mosaic and rabbinical laws as regulate diet, priestly purity, and dress originated in ages under the influence of ideas entirely foreign to our present mental and spiritual state. They failed to impress the modern Jew with the spirit of priestly holiness. Their observance in our days is apt rather to obstruct than to further modern spiritual elevation. Right? This is the part that always gets me. It's not just that talus and tefillin aren't necessary, but optional. It's that they are an impediment and therefore need to be outlawed. Jack. Basically, am, am I, can you hear me? Yeah. Basically, it's, it's, it's stating that assimilation is what really matters. Complete assimilation, doing away with the ritual and the, and the rest having to do with religion is pushed at this point. So I, I hesitate to say complete. But I would say that there are there maybe maybe a practical or a, pra a practical assimilation, right? Because there were still beliefs that the Jews held on to, right? They, you know, the idea, for example, of believing in Jesus as Messiah was never a piece of this. So there were there were some sacred cows that even the early reformers were were not going to go into. That would have been full assimilation to become Christian. But yes, in terms of practice what you eat, how you dress, what you do, 
there was a huge push towards assimilation in those regards. And I think that what happened is we realized later on that it's hard to have one without the other, right? That you need some of these practices to reinforce the morality. You need some of these practices to reinforce the ideology. And I think that we're still figuring that out, even in 2020, right? Even at Bethel, you know, when we think about how we practice, we're trying to figure out what does our practice do to enhance our spirituality, to enhance our sense of moral grounding, to enhance our sense of ideology, and where it does, we should run with it, and where it doesn't, we can forego it. I think that we would disagree. I know that I would disagree with this blanket statement that they fail to impress the modern Jew with the spirits, and they are apt to obstruct. I don't think that they obstruct. I think there are many ways in which doing things like wearing talis, wearing kippah, putting on tefillin, having a dietary ethic, have a Shabbat practice, if done in a meaningful way, can add. But that doesn't mean it has to be Shomer Shabbos. There's a happy medium in that. And that's, I think, where the reform movement has come in, in our age. But we're 140 years later. We're in a different place. Our goals of assimilation are different than the goals of assimilation in 1885. We recognize the modern era of universal culture, of heart and intellect, the approaching of the realization of Israel's great messianic hope for the establishment. Oh, too far. Hang on. Go back one. No, don't go two. Of the kingdom of truth. Hang on. Sorry. There's a delay on my, on my thing. It's the Zoom. It's slow. The kingdom of truth, justice, and peace among all men. I will say women now, too, and nine binary folk. We consider ourselves no longer a nation, but a religious community, and therefore expect neither a return to Palestine, nor a sacral worship, sacrificial worship under the sons of Aaron, nor the restoration of any of the laws concerning a Jewish state. This is powerful and problematic in several ways, right? The idea of us no longer being a nation right, a group of people with a political and ethnic identity only being a religion, I think, is problematic, even if you want to live in America, right? But it plays into where we are. Are we Russians? Are we Jews? Are we American? You know, this is in an era where the rise of nationalism is knocking on the doorstep. The question that, that Napoleon asked the French leaders, are you French or are you Jew?, I think that the early reformers here are trying to have it both ways, which is that we are both and neither, right? My nationality is American. My religiosity is Jewish. Um, I know I don't feel that way. I think that I'm both. I'm a member of both nations, right? Now, if you get rid of the nationality of being Jewish, then you see why the need for a national homeland goes out the window. And so they don't, you know, they can call against for the establishment of of a state in Palestine. What's interesting to me is I think that there is an intellectual contradiction to say we are a religious community that doesn't need the sacrificial worship because the sacrificial worship was the religious expression in the Torah. I think I would have voted against that piece even if I voted for the peace of Palestine if I believed that we were no longer a nation. Um, now I don't believe that anymore and we know that the platforms and the positions that came later contradicted a lot of this, right? We know by Columbus in 37, they're actually pushing for the establishment of the states. It happens to be in the midst of World War II and the Holocaust, right? And our movement's attitude towards Zionism changes in a practical way. This is problematic to me. Yeah, Jack, go ahead. This may sound somewhat redundant, but as I understand what you said, that it took 60,000 people to form a state. That's that what the says. I had thought that's that's what we said at the beginning. Yeah, the Constitution says that 60,000 people in a new area can make their own state. How come the, the Jews just didn't move west and form a new state? Some of them did move west, but never in numbers that large. Right? There were Jews in South Dakota, but the westward expansion piece of it, and, and I think it's because we never really left the ghetto in a certain way, right? I mean, we know that American Jewish community, while there are outposts and there is small town Jewish life, so much of American Jewish life retained the idea that living in larger metropoles amongst other Jews is the place where we want to be, right? 
including here in the sixth borough of Boca Raton and, you know, in its environs, right? Debbie said her Zadie moved to Denver. Denver is now a big Jewish community, right? As became San Francisco, as became Los Angeles, as was Chicago, as are Dallas and Houston, as was Greenwood, Mississippi, as was Charleston in 1865 and New Orleans. But we saw that the immigrants that came particularly from Eastern Europe in the latter half of the 20th century, or the 19th century, ended up being, for the most part, city folk. They were city folk until the 1950s and 60s, and then they became city folk and suburbanites. Raise your hand if that's your family's story. Look around the screen, right? The majority, the overall majority, are city slash suburban folk. They didn't go to that west. There were Jews who went west and who became frontier Jews, but not as many. And even those, a lot of them had their origins in the earlier wave of immigration in the first half of the 19th century, which was more focused from Western Europe, Alsace, Lorraine, and that area, um, and had a different mentality and had much smaller numbers. El Paso, exactly. Thanks, Debbie. All right. The last bit, the last bits of the, of the platform. We recognize Judaism as a progressive religion, striving to meet accord with the postulates of reason, convinced of the utmost necessity of preserving the historical identity from our great past, Christianity and Islam being daughter religions of Judaism. We appreciate their providential mission and aid in the spreading of monotheistic and moral truth. We acknowledge that the spirit of broad humanity of our age is our ally in the fulfillment of our mission. And therefore we extend the hand of fellowship to all who cooperate with us and the establishment of the reign of truth and righteousness among men, singing Brian, Hart, Brian Sedell's heartstring songs of truth and righteousness. There was Emmis back then, Brian, in 1885. We reassert the doctrine of Judaism that the soul is immortal, grounding the belief in the divine nature of the human spirit, which forever finds bliss in righteousness and misery in wickedness. We reject as ideas not rooted in Judaism, the beliefs both in bodily resurrection and in Gehenna and in Eden, hell and paradise, as abodes for everlasting punishment and reward. In a full accordance with the spirit of the Mosaic legislation, we, which strives to regulate the relations between rich and poor, we deem it our duty to participate in the great task of modern times, to solve, and on the basis of justice and righteousness, the problems presented by the contrast and evils of present organization in society. We see ourselves having a, a social justice need, which comes from Torah. We have to help heal the ills of the world around us. Tikkun Olam is a part of who we are. Hold all those ideas in contrast to what's going to come next. The, un the Orthodox Jewish Congregational Union in America, 14 years later, had a convention in New York. The principles of their convention were a, a resolution favoring Zionism. This conference of delegates from Jewish congregations in the United States and the Dominion of Canada, Shirley and Julie, is convened to advance the interest of positive biblical, rabbinical, and historical Judaism. We are assembled not as a synod, and therefore we have no legislative authority to amend religious questions. This is not a halakhic practice, but as a representative body by which organization and cooperation we will endeavor to advance the interest of Judaism in America. This is not questions of Judaism, but a question of religious organization. We favor the convening of a Jewish synod, specifically authorized by congregations to meet and to be comprised of men who must be certified as rabbis and A, elders in official positions, men of wisdom and understanding among us, able men, God-fearing men, men of truth, hating prophet, right? We do need to have a body of rabbis in this country to answer questions of Jewish law. But here's what we know so far. We believe in the divine revelation of the Bible, and we declare that the prophets in no way discountenanced ceremonial duty, but only condemned the personal life of those who observed ceremonial law, but disregarded the moral. Ceremonial law is not optative, it is obligatory. I had to look the word optative up. 
I didn't know the word optative. Anyone know the word optative? No, it means wishful, right? They're already throwing shade on the reform movements. Ceremonial law is not only for fun. It's not for playing games. It's not dress up time. It's essential. It's as essential as the moral obligations are. One does not supersede the other. You can't be a good Jew and only be compelled by our moral obligations. You have to also be compelled by our ritual obligations. We affirm our adherence to the acknowledged codes of our rabbis and the 13 principles of Maimonides. Anima Amin, I believe in perfect faith that there is one God, that we only have one soul, that we will be resurrected at the end of times, right? All the things that Maimonides talked about. We believe that in our dispersion, diasporic dispersion, right? We know that's the same word. We are to be united with our brethren of alien faith and all that devolves upon men as citizens, but that religiously and right ceremonies and ideals and doctrine are separate and must remain separate in accordance with the divine doctrine. Asher bachar bano mikol ha'amim. I have separated you from among the nations to be mine, right? That we can live in community with other peoples, but we must maintain our religiosity and be separate. Why? Because we are the chosen one. Bacharti, I have chosen you to be my nation, God said. And further to prevent misunderstanding concerning Judaism, we affirm our belief in the coming of a personal Messiah. And we protest against the admission of proselytes into the fold of Judaism without Mila and Tevila, right? There will be a Messiah, a human, a human guy or woman to be Messiah. And knowing that by this time, the reform movement had already said, you can have conversion without circumcision and without immersion, which by the way, I participated in a debate in Mikvah this morning. We're still doing this at the beach. It was crowded at 8.30, I was surprised. They said, no. We're going to maintain the traditional laws around conversion, which require Mila, circumcision, and Tevila, immersion. We protest against intermarriage between Jew and Gentile. We protest against the idea that we are merely a religious sect, throwing more shade at the reformers, and maintain that we are a nation, though temporarily without a national home. And furthermore, that the restoration of Zion is the legitimate aspiration of scattered Israel, and in no way conflicting with our loyalty to the land in which we may dwell or may dwell at any time. Finally, last bit. The following are extracts from the constitution of the organization known as the Orthodox Jewish Congregational Union of America. The object of this organization will be to promote the religious sects and interests of the Jews of America and the maintenance of the welfare of Orthodox Judaism congregations in America. All Orthodox Jewish congregations in America shall be eligible to membership and entitled to representation in the meetings of the union on application for membership. The executive committee dot, dot, dot shall admit. This is the OU as you and I know it today, right? You know, that kosher symbol with the U with the O around it. This is them, 1898. Now, Final question, since we're five minutes over. All right, I have a question. Well, I have a, hang on, Phyllis, one second. I'm going to ask first. If you feel like your personal ideology is closer to that of the statement of the Pittsburgh platform, raise your hand. If you feel like your personal ideology is closer to the statements in this statement from the OU, Keep your hand down. Raise your hand if you're an early reformer or keep your hand down if you're an early orthodox. So I see some early reformers and I see some I'm not sure. I'll be really honest. I think that we are closer in the reform movement in 2020 to some of the principles in this statement about orthodoxy than the early reformer statement. We have become Zionist. We participate in the ceremony rights and laws. We have a dietary ethic. We put Tichiyat HaMetim back in the Sidur when it was published in 2008, right? The redemption 
and all that kind of stuff. And that was in case I had to turn this off. I'm gonna stop sharing, right? It's just very interesting to think where we are. Thanks, Debbie. Have a good day. I know you're gonna jump. It seems like so in many if I, if you ask me where I was in 1898, I would say I'm closer to the OEO, even though I'm reformed, because we know where the reform movement has gone. The Pittsburgh platform was the farthest left swing, and from there, it begun to swing back towards the right, so to speak. Phyllis, you had a question. Um, yes. It talked about um, the Orthodox talked about the homeland. I believe they said refer to a home, a nation. Um, so I assume they were referring to Israel, what would become Israel. Yeah. Or, uh, but I thought that, I don't know that it was just Chabad or the Orthodox who didn't um, believe in Israel because of um, the Messiah or something hadn't come. So you're, let's clarify a few things. Always from the moment the, of the origins of the rabbinic movement in, in the second century, third century of the common era, there was a desire for the reestablishment of the priesthood and the temple in Jerusalem and all of that good stuff. Okay. In 1898, when this statement was written, it was around the same time as the beginning of the Zionist movements, and in particular, the beginnings of, um, of Herzl Zionism. So within orthodoxy, there were kind of two camps. There was one camp who was, who was fully behind the idea of the reestablishment of a political state in Israel for Jews that would be a Jewish state. And there were some Orthodox Jews who felt like, actually, we can't do that because it's for God to create that. So I think, Phyllis, the presumption that Orthodox were anti-Zionist is an oversimplification. There were some Jews who were and some Jews who were not. There were some Orthodox Jews who were and some Orthodox Jews who were not. The OU has always been, from its origins, a Zionist camp within Orthodoxy, right? And the, the, the figuring out what a modern day political state that is Orthodox Jewish in its character has always been kind of the tension that they've had to navigate. And that's where we are today. We have, we have a, a modern state, which is a democracy that has instilled within the chief rabbinate an Orthodox institution, a lot of political authority over life in Israel. And there are a lot of Jews who live in Israel and who live outside of Israel who are even more religious, who reject the authority or the, or, or, and, and don't participate in the life of the state. One last question before we go, if there are any. Were you a history major? No, political <laughs> science. I said, were you a history major? Polit no. Political science. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.